morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our guests this morning. I'll let your uncle, I had to remember what he was, uh, introduce the two of you. And Grandma and Grandpa back there, if they want to introduce their guests, that would be um, wonderful too. With that. I gotta do this without crying. This young lady is my niece, Rob, and her husband Jim. They live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we got separated 50 years ago. And she found me about two and a half years ago. And Friday was the first time I had seen her since 1962. Long time. And when she came to the house Friday, she come and opened the door, and she came up the steps. She looks like a rucker. There's no denying that. <laughs> and it, I'm just so glad that they're here. And uh, I am going to say, don't tell Rob. <laughs> okay. I have two young ladies with me this morning. I have three young ladies with me this morning. <laughs> Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Give us your name. <coughs> and what is your name? Valentina. <laughs> and Valentina. They're our names, granddaughters. Girls. Yeah. Good to have you back again, girls. Remember where the basket is with the crayons and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, time for announcements. Does anyone have anything they would like to raise? The dumpster will be here until like Tuesday or Wednesday. I know it's pretty well full, but I'm sure there's a little crack or ante there that you can stick something in it if you want to get rid of it. But he left it here a couple extra days. Okay. that there is a women's UMW uh, United Methodist Women's Luncheon right after church next Sunday and we're providing all the food. Um, there will be a lunch and then a brief business meeting and maybe most important thing is probably election of a new president for the UMW. So. And then plans for the upcoming next four months. So you want to make sure you show up because then you won't be nominated. For <laughs> <laughs> I believe threats work. Yeah. <laughs> um, Beth. Yeah, for uh, choir members who are here, we want, due to various combinations of folks being away most of September, including myself, um, we will start rehearsal not until the 25th of September, and we will try to sing something the 25th.
So what we're going to do Wednesday night is Frank's going to come talk to us and <clears throat> excuse me, um, and go over what the process is and see what the wishes of that committee is and um, then move forward from there. The first step would be to form a committee to investigate it, uh, to see what's involved, whether we want to do that or not. It's a very simple step, but we can't do it if you don't show up for the meeting. So I'm hoping that we will um, have a group here. Whatever the numbers are, that's our quorum. And we're going to go with the will of the group that's here. So I hope it's more than just me and Frank. Um, and I know there will be others, but um, just uh, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. One of those things that kind of changed the schedule a bit, a little bit. Here, it's going to be here. here in the sanctuary. Um, my feeling is you don't yell at one another in the sanctuary. <laughs> so I don't know that there's anybody who has a propensity to yell, but if they do, they won't do it here. All right, next Sunday. This is going to be a fun Sunday. It's called Holy Humor Sunday, and we are going to make jokes throughout the entire service. The service, of course, is about God, and that's not a joke. But Holy Humor Sunday began on this, the Sunday after Easter in response to the great gift that was given to us on Easter. I decided after the summer we've had, we need some jokes now. And Ruthie did a joy uh, sermon down under the pavilion, and that's where the idea came from. So, your homework is to bring at least one, preferably two or three, jokes that are appropriate to the church setting um, <clears throat> to share at different times during the, the service. There will actually be, we'll do the call of worship, there'll be a joke, we'll do the prayer, there'll be a joke, that kind of stuff. And if people have a lot of jokes, we'll do more than one at a time. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you about humor and remind you that Christ laughed, too. Um, I think it's going to be a good Sunday. And George, you're a special music? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going without special music? You had mentioned you had talked to Savannah and Andy. That was for the 22nd. No, yeah, that's Can you hear what I just made this? Well, then, next Sunday? Uh-huh. No. Yeah. I can ask Savannah. It depends on her work. So. Okay. You could have somebody tell the joke if you want to sing a song. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can do it, yeah. Alex. <laughs> I'm just thinking about putting that on the spot. <laughs> you can have Savannah. I won't be here. So, you, can, you can launch your stand up career. <laughs> <laughs> you can launch your stand up career. Maybe I could have Savannah do a Jim Stafford song or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, next week is for fun. We'll try to keep it under control. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to keep drinking or I won't have a voice. Um, <clears throat> the um, supplies for NISA, uh, we sent with them a large bag of food and a whole bunch of school supplies, but we are still collecting them. By the way, when is that back room going to get set up again? Or is it? I thought you didn't want I kind of like it, but... Uh, we don't need it. Okay. We won't do it then. When we need it, When we need it, we'll put it back. Okay. Um, that's a good space for KIDSs to run around um, and have a good time. <laughs> yeah. All right, any other announcements? Hey, I forgot. Um, a couple weeks ago, I went to the dollar store and bought stuff for the little free pantry, and Ham said um, the cupboard was pretty bare that day. And then I took some other stuff last Saturday, not this past Saturday, not yesterday, but the last, last week. There were three cans of beans. That was it. So, if you ever want to drop anything off, the last time I put stuff in, I even put in toothpaste, tooth 
toothbrushes, um, oh, shampoo, deodorant. Cause, and I figured, and like two days before I was there, Miller's United Methodist Church had put in 64 items. They had wrote down the number that they put in, and it was all gone in two days. Yeah. So I want to say that that little free pantry does get used a lot. And um, I've been twice since you were there. Um, there were three cans and a rotten cucumber. <laughs> um, when I went back, there were a couple more cans, but what I had taken before was gone. Yeah. And I, I took some more stuff, and um, I dare say it's probably back to empty again. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Cereal seems to be a big one, cereal and tuna. Where is it at? You know, where St. John's, well, when you get to the Shell gas station, mm -hmm. make a right. Go to the stop sign and make a left. It's that building right down on the left. It's a little right. white building. A little white building. There's a door and wall. Oh. It's a square. It's a square. Oh. square. And all you got to do is open the door. There's a clipboard. It says, are you dropping off? Are you picking up? And you just... I just write like Emory Church or Emory Women and, you know, just really put right down and, you know, they don't, they and don't I just, take anything. I just check. You don't have to put anything other than that you were there to make a donation. Mm -hmm. And you write the date, I think. The date and that you yeah. were Okay. Um, Elaine, I just thought of something um, talking about free pantries. I haven't opened the door to look inside and see what's there, but there is a little box in front of Fink's Pharmacy, Fink's Bird Pharmacy, up on 140. It says Little Free Library. Books. Books. Awesome. And I, I, I see it all the time when I'm there, and I never opened it to look inside. I will do that, but it is there. I said people want to put books in there. And these are just, I mean, Go to the store, get your groceries, stop by and put a can on the shelf or a box of cereal or something. Um, I'm glad that the box items don't stay long because I did notice there's little traps in there too. <laughs> we don't want bugs and stuff. So. Anyway, any other announcements? <coughs> if not, Pat, would you lead us in praise music? Good morning. First praise song is number 654, Change My Heart, O oh God. Change my heart.
Please be seated. The Old Testament reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 4 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your ancestors find in me, that they went far from me, and went after worthless things, and became worthless themselves? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, Where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they, they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. And now we have the Psalter, which is Psalm 8, 81, 1, 10 to 16. Okay. Okay, there's no, I'm not saying 10 to 16. We made it up. Okay. It is not in the hymnal. Oh, so that's slot number 803? No. All right. Okay. submit to me. So, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. And I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him, and their doom would last forever. I would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. 
But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That says a reading from the Gospel and from our other scriptures, may God aid us in our understanding and ability to live according to it.
all so much again for the welcome back. We are one of the duet versions of Worldly Game. For those of you who were here several weeks ago, we're called Full Quartet with my parents. Uh, it's very, very fun to play music in every single configuration of the family, whether it's parent, child, spousal, and combinations thereof. So those of you who are not familiar with the instruments that we're playing, uh, Brian is playing a Swedish keyed fiddle called a Nykelhakpa. Um, come up to me for the spelling if you're curious. Um, and then the instrument I am holding is a viola da gamba ditto. Um, Ryan's has 16 strings, but you only ever play on four of them. Mine has seven, and you play on all of them. Um, you guys are very lucky this morning to experience something brand new. Um, this strap that I'm currently holding the instrument with, this is its first time out. It is a prototype design. Um, and yeah, you guys are the first to hear it. So, uh, <laughs> sure. so here's a question for you. Viola da gamba literally means viola of the legs. Gamba is uh, true. like the time for leg. But is this viola da live? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, until then, we're going to play another Swedish tune called Slime Polska after Biskala.
Okay. It is time for us to share our joys and concerns with one another and with our Lord. So I ask you to share. Um, Amy, our daughter, who was born at this church basically, and she grew up in this church, went to Sunday school, is getting married on Friday and she's very happy. And she said to tell everybody in Emory hello and five more days. She's very excited. And Mr. Peg is going to perform the ceremony, so we're happy for her. She's waited a long time. Yes. So she's and, happy. and they are very happy. I was going to do a blessing of the nuptials because the scripture I'm preaching on is the gospel that has the wedding feast in it. Um, but three people are working to be here for that, so we're going to bless them anyway. Um, others? Evan? Yeah, let's all pray for the reduction in gun violence in Baltimore. I mean, it's just totally gotten out of hand. And I can't imagine somebody living in Baltimore City trying to raise their kids in that kind of environment. Thank you, Evan. And it's not just Baltimore, it's so many, many places. Anyone else? Okay, um, today is Labor Day Sunday. Tomorrow is Labor Day. Uh, it's more than just a day when people get off work and you have picnics and be with the family and such. It was originally um, created by someone in the labor movement to honor workers. And so I'm going to invite you when you go out today and tomorrow, uh, if you come upon somebody who's actually working, um, tell them thank you. Uh, smile at them. Um, it means a world of difference to folks. I have a sad prayer. Um, Dee Patton's cancer has returned in the lymph nodes. She doesn't want to share a whole lot about what that means or what she's choosing to do, but she does welcome prayers. So please hold her in prayer. She may have shared with others because she's doing it a little bit of time. Um, I spent um, a good deal of time with her just talking about um, what the possibilities are, talking about um, Bob, talking about the future, um, and um, just know that uh, it's, it's a difficult situation that I don't think she's quite let herself feel, um, but she will. So hold her in prayer, please, and Bob, too. If there are no other prayers, let us go to our Lord. Holy God, we give you thanks for being with us in all the joys and the trials of our lives, for walking each day with us so that when we start this journey, we know that we are not alone. When we walk this journey, we know that we are not alone. And when we come to the end of this part of our journey, we know we are we give you thanks for this church and for the loving hearts that make up the church, for the ways in which we serve the community, for the ways in which we help one another, for the ways in which we celebrate you by coming together to worship. <coughs> I pray for this church and that summer ends and people return and the, uh, the whole spirit of the church is lifted up by you. There's much going on, much to look forward to in the future, and much for which to be grateful. Take our prayers and add it to the prayer that you as our Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
The sacrament of Holy Communion will be on your screen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks for your grace. <clears throat> it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to the promised land, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. For the sacrament in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the sacrament in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we've been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were so evil, now we are pure people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ. We call this out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word. On the third day, he raised him from the dead. He was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit. These are the usual elements that come to the communion table. We use a fancy loaf of bread. They would have used a uh, flat, unleavened piece of bread. We use Welch's grape juice, thanks to a United Methodist who didn't want to be a stumbling block to those who uh, have trouble with addiction. And as a community of Emory, when we come to the table, we bring the love of God in our hearts with us. And when we commune, we take the nourishment for our bodies and our spirits and then take that out into the world as those who are um, proclaimers of Christ. We take the bread and we break it in half as a symbol of Christ's body broken for us. We take the wine and bless it, knowing that it's that which reminds us of the covenant of God in Christ's blood. Jesus took that wine of bread and blessed it and he shared it with people around the table. He said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And the cup would have been a large untouched cup on the table. He picked it up thereby saying, I am the one that you have been waiting for. He blessed that cup, and he shared it with everybody around the table. And again he said, do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And let the people say Amen. Amen. As United Methodists, we celebrate an open table of communion. We are asked to come at the direction of the ushers. Um, Sherry and I will be down front. You take a piece of the bread, dip it lightly into um, the juice, uh, and return to your seat in prayer. This is the feast of God for the people of God. together in the prayer after receiving the elements. Thank you. 
Robin has never seen me sing real, but she's seen many re recordings of singing Old Holy Night with the carol singers. And my daughter Melissa would record at the concert and through technology would be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, not long after I quit singing. So Robin, this is for you. Grateful chorus, praise we let all with. 
can shorten my sermon, but not by the entire thing. Oh, I guess I should. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you remember the 1967 uh, film, which was real controversial, called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Spencer Tracy, Sidney Poitier, Catherine Hepburn, and Catherine Houghton. And in this film, the daughter of a well-to-do white family comes home from a vacation to announce her intentions of marrying a well-to-do black physician. The plot thickens as Joanna Drayton brings John Prentice home to dinner to meet her parents who do not know that John is black. And John's parents also come into town for the Drayton's dinner in order to meet Joanna, and they learn that she is white while being greeted at the airport. Now, today that's not such a big deal. But back in the 60s, it was a huge deal. Interracial marriage was, especially in the South, one of those things that just wasn't um, talked about, even though it was being done. In some places, it was still illegal uh, for an interracial couple to get married. This movie was bold because it made a statement about what was right versus what our prejudice sometimes has us doing. Uh, it presents a cultural taboo at the time, uh, and that's around the dinner table. And it's that dinner table that says something about who's in and who's out. You see, table's not only where we say grace, but it's a space where we extend grace if we're being true to our Lord. To Luke, nothing is more sacred than the dining table. The Eucharist and revelations of the risen Christ occur there. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit will come while he's eating. Jews and Gentiles reflect the nature of the church through table fellowship. And of course, the Eucharist is set at the table of the Last Supper. The table is taken so seriously that Jesus gets into trouble because of his eating buddies. He was known as a friend of tax collectors and publicans and sinners because he ate with them. Inviting others to table could be a sign of affluence or status, but also could be a sign of service or a sign of acceptance as equals, creating egalitarian fellowship through the breaking of the bread. Table fellowship meant full acceptance of one another and the inclusiveness of Jesus revealed by the company he kept, especially of the socially ostracized. Now the table says something about who's in and who's out. So who is at the table? This is the most obvious part of this parable in Luke. Jesus begins by teaching guests about table manners. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit down at the place of honor, but when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place. Social status was obviously based on the seating of dinner guests, as it still is in some fancy dinners. And Jesus tells the guests to seat the lower place so that the host can then move them up to a higher place. If you humble yourself, he says, you'll be um, exalted. But if you try to exalt yourself, you could be not only humbled, but humiliated. The peril of exaltation is that it wipes out any notion of equality. This humble posture is not just for the guests. Jesus also tells the um, people who are throwing uh, the dinners um, to look low as well. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and then you would be repaid. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Guess who's coming to dinner? Not your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, but strangers and the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, those from whom we can't get anything in return for our hospitality, those who have no social or economic status, those who can't help us get connected to the influential, those who are not the usual suspects around the table of welcome. 
That's why I continually say this church is open to all. It's almost like we ought to go stand on the sidewalk and wave banners. Come on in, come on in. Christian or not. Saved or not. Clean or not. Acceptable or not. You are here. And this is God's house. Now, in the kingdom, hospitality is free. And there is no expectation of reciprocity. Rest of giving back. <laughs> it's unconditional service at the table. No strings attached. Haven't you heard that before about our faith? No strings attached. It was given to us with no strings. We are to share with no strings. No stipulations placed on the other in order for them to be a part of the kingdom. The invitation list is already a huge change from the norm because those invited to this table are different from, even strange sometimes, compared to the host. But isn't that what hospitality is all about? Welcome, the stranger. When I was little, I was told that whoever came was welcome at the table, and you always fed them the best, even if you didn't know them, maybe especially if you didn't know them. Having the other at the table is something special, somebody not like myself, but like the rest of God's people. It makes for a better table. And if I go to a banquet and I try to take the seat of honor, it is right that the host should ask me to step down and to let others take the higher seat. It's the reason there's three or four of us who struggle to be the last person um, to get food on Wednesdays are wonderful. And I lose every time to Randy. <laughs> Simply will not be bested. It's the idea, though, that the host always goes last and the guests eat first. Nowhere does Jesus say the goal is sameness. We're not cookie-cutter Christians. He doesn't guilt us into meeting the needs of the poor. He simply says, because everything that was given to you, maybe it would be a good idea to invite these other people give to them. Be blessed because they cannot repay you. The peril of exaltation is that it wipes out any notion of equality. So if we try to we <coughs> exalt ourselves, we've really messed up what Jesus had in mind. And if a church tries to say it's better than, oh, I don't know, the Jewish temple or even that big community church across the way, then we're doing it wrong. All are welcome at Jesus' table. Now, remember that Jesus is telling us this parable while he's sitting in a meal with a Pharisee. His love for the poor does not mean he has to hate someone else. Jesus speaks to everyone, guests and hosts, the privileged and the underprivileged, about the table, about hospitality, because Hospitality, as one scholar author Southern notes, is the practice of which the church stands or falls. It's that important. If we don't have a true hospitality, we are no longer church, and it will not be long before that church has gone. Now, the table is invaluable, and not only who's at the table, but whose table it really is. See, that's what we have to remember: is that none of this is ours. The table belongs. Christ belongs to God. Whose banquet is it anyway? This might not be obvious as who's at the table. It's not the Pharisee's table, nor is it the host's or guest table. It's the table of Jesus Christ. And we announce that every time we share communion. This wedding banquet is a banquet of all those who might not have been invited, but have, who have been invited or there. And this is where I would have done the blessing of the nuptials for Amy and Zach, right here at the wedding banquet. The larger literary context of this banquet is talk about the kingdom of God. The table represents the kingdom. Who are we to say who is in and who is out? Who are we to say that we have a higher position in the kingdom than a homeless person on the street or of any of the 
others that we tend to make. This says more about God's indiscriminate hospitality than it does about us. And it's so risky that the last image, or the image of the Last Supper, has all of the disciples there, including Jesus Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, who will uh, betray Jesus. Now, the thing with hospitality is we are made vulnerable. Because we have said anyone can come in. It takes our way of life and makes it a little shaky. Hospitality comes with no strings attached, so anyone is welcome. Jesus' banquet is free, but there is no mention of food at this banquet table. Did you notice that? The food comes later with the body and the blood, but there is no food at the banquet. That lets us decide what are we going to serve. What will we share at the table other than food with those who are different from us? Maybe we'll exchange new ideas about a social insight or insights into cancer research. Maybe we'll cooperate and work together on a community service project. Maybe we'll share friendships with someone whom we haven't even met yet. Maybe we'll give someone an open ear or understanding when no one else will. And maybe we'll share our hearts with hopes and dreams for the future. And maybe they will too. Maybe we'll take the risk and share ourselves to welcome someone in order to give them a sense of belonging, to affirm their value, and to assure them that they are loved. Maybe, just maybe, we'll share more than food at the welcome table. And through our hospitality, we too will be blessed. The Holy Spirit has invited us all to sit at the welcome table, not just one of these days, but today. And with God's help, so be it. Amen. The welcome table will be Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Please come be a part of that. Our hymn, as I said before, is going to be When the Poor Wins. Number 434, the United Methodist Hymn.
a nice weekend with family and friends and remember those who work still and give thanks for the opportunity you may have had um, to work in the past and um, always keep in mind those that we have lifted in prayer. I send you forth wrapped in the arms of one who loves you beyond reason, beyond anything that we can think about. And I send you forth with hearts full of that love <coughs> to share with the world. Go in peace and may the peace of God go with you. Amen. Amen. Amen.